Hello, I'm Gabby Mendez. And I'm Felix Cabute Jr. You are now listening to the Talk 20s podcast. This podcast is your ultimate guide to adult life, where we discuss with the help of our amazing guests, all the things that we were never taught in school. Adult life can be really isolating as everyone's got their own thing going on. But remember, you're never alone. There are over 7 million of us 20 somethings all trying to figure it out. Let's unpack a new topic in today's episode. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Talk 20s podcast. If you've not already, make sure you follow and subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode of us in the studio. Today, we're joined in the studio by multi-award winning reporter, author and TikTok creator, Sophia smith Gala. I've been super excited about today's episode because we're talking about a topic that no one really talks about in your 20s and that is sex. I am so excited. You just got a big (laughs) breath. Felix is just taking a big breath in there. Um, because it's a topic that we don't talk about enough, no, you know, as 20 somethings and there isn't enough information out on there. You know, we're not taught this stuff in school at all. Um, so hello, Sophia. Welcome hello. to the podcast. It's amazing to have you here. I have to ask you one question first and foremost. You're a journalist that talks about so many different topics. Mm. What made you want to write this book, Losing It? It's because I'm a journalist that I wanted to write it. Mm-hmm. The, the need for it was really obvious. So first of all, the idea came to me as as me, Sophia, not not as a journalist, just as me thinking about my own personal experiences and also the experiences of my peer group, my mates, or stuff that you hear about. You might even read about it in a magazine uh, or you read about it online. And I can remember growing up thinking, I had a lot of questions And I couldn't necessarily ask people about those questions. And those I could ask were probably my mates who were as clueless as I was, uh, but um, would probably give advice anyway, like maybe I would. You know, (laughs) our information sources aren't always as good as we'd like them to be because the taboo drives us into thinking we can't we can't raise it with with certain people. Mm. Anyway, I thought my sex education was rubbish. I thought it really poorly prepared me for adult life. And I reflect upon it regularly as an adult because I'm forced to um, in the relationships that I have, in the sex that I have, in the sex life that I want for myself, I have to revisit and think about things that have happened to me regularly. We often don't attach that to our sex ed. We often attach it to, oh, it's just the world we live in, blah, Mm -hmm. blah, blah. No, 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 we shouldn't be happy with that. We should probe it and investigate it. So, yeah, I could sit there like playing a little tiny violin for myself the whole time thinking, what a shame things like this happen to me. What if it's happening at scale? Mm -hmm. And we know it is happening from scale. There are copious amounts of data that tell us that there is a problem, not only in the United Kingdom, but worldwide. But if we take the United Kingdom as an example, we know that sex education has not been prioritized. And we know that there are pretty scary statistics out there. Like, for example, 40% of young women and 26% of young men feel that their first time does not happen at the right time. Mm. That is a statistic that should be making headlines. That is a statistic that should be disturbing us because it's very likely that those young people will go on to have negative uh, outcomes in their sexual health uh, as they proceed into sexual maturity and live their, live their adult lives. So that's why I wrote it. It became quickly evident that there is loads of research out there telling us to take sexual health, equity, justice, well-being far more seriously than we do. And because we don't, innumerable harms are occurring to so many of us. And it is all of us. We are all harmed by this. Women, I would say, are very perniciously harmed by it, especially uh, heterosexual women uh, and the gender norms that they're still facing in heterosexual relationships. But everyone has lost out because we've not prioritized sex education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's such a valuable conversation. I, I'm really keen to know, why do you think it's so poorly taught in schools and we aren't having these conversations that we should be having? Taboo is a significant part of it, but it's not the only part of it. So we do still really need to recognize that lots of people, despite a culture where sometimes it feels like we can't escape sex positivity and like, you must be orgasming all the time, mm. especially I feel like as a young woman, I am fed a lot of that messaging and I am fed that messaging without it necessarily addressing 
for example, the heterosexual orgasm gap that exists for lots of heterosexual women because of uh, gender norms and ideas around sex, when sex begins, when sex ends. Uh, if you're lucky, sex may begin with foreplay in a lot of scenarios, but it will often end in heterosexual scenarios with the male orgasm. Mm -hmm. um, and many women, research has shown, will be leaving sexual experiences without having had their pleasure taken seriously. Um, and lots of other regards, like the stat I just mentioned about the 40% of young women and 26% of young men thinking sex didn't happen, first sex didn't happen at the right time. Why are there more women than men saying that? Mm -hmm. Really worth pointing out as well, right at the beginning of this podcast, that the research we have about sex is not great. Uh, it's getting better all the time, but most of it has been done in Europe, North America. Most of it has been done about heterosexual people. Mm -hmm. So we are really quite impoverished when it comes to actually looking at the lifestyles and needs and desires of anyone who falls outside of the, outside of being heterosexual and often also being white. Mm -hmm. um, so we're already working from a really limited resource. Then you add the taboo in and then you add the, the, the fact that we, I think what came out in the book is that some people are just they just feel like they have to deal with a lot of trauma or bad stuff by themselves or that when crimes happen or injustice happens, it's kind of, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. No, I would argue it doesn't have to be that way. Research is telling us what positive sexual health and sexual outlooks look, look like. Um, we deserve access to that information, not only when we're at school, before we start having sex, into our adulthood, all the way through all the decades of adulthood that we enjoy, we always need information about sex. Um, what if new research comes out that is about the sex that you have every day or every week or every month or every year, however regularly mm -hmm. you may choose or wish to have it, if new research comes out, shouldn't you know it? And I couldn't believe all the stuff I was reading for my book that I was learning for the first time. Research that had come out while I was at school a teacher could have told me that. Someone could have disseminated that to me. I was curious, inquisitive about the world, mature enough to understand these themes. And it does not trickle down. Mm -hmm. I think that really highlights the importance of the book and mm -hmm. really having that honest and open conversation that has to be had. I mean, you both touched on a few things there, which is really important. Firstly, Gabby, you said the lack of conversation in schools. You were saying the information source, which is often schools or the research. Um, a phrase that comes out is um, a condom over a banana, and then that's the end of the, that's the end of the lesson. Um, why is this, why is that just not enough for a sex education um, talk or education? When I interviewed a lot of people in the UK of different ages, but all generally speaking between their early and late twenties, I would say, when you ask them what do you remember from sex ed, if you had it, they will often remember some kind of anecdote involving rolling a condom down a banana. I did actually have one young woman tell me that she can recall her school and all girls school being taught it and the boys school across the road not being taught how to put condoms on. What? Mm -hmm. So, right, there is an issue there. That's the right reaction to have to that. <laughs> That's uh, mm -hmm. horrifying. I had someone else tell me about how at their school to encourage them to not have sex when drunk they had to wear glasses that distorted their vision and roll a condom down a banana. And the idea that the task was made a lot more difficult because they were drunk and the messaging that they were trying to give them is don't have sex when you're drunk. This messaging was given to a young Muslim woman who will never get drunk because uh -huh. she doesn't drink. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of issues where actually people's own backgrounds and how sex will apply to them is entirely ignored by the education system. My caveat is there are brilliant teachers out there. Mm -hmm. there, there are brilliant uh, people really trying to, to not deliver teaching like this, mm -hmm. but timetables are really packed. And also they've not been, uh, lots of teachers do not feel they've give, been given the good enough training to deliver sex education. Mm -hmm. back, to the, back to the condoms and rolling them down bananas. What if you don't use condoms when you have sex? 
uh, what if you're a, a lesbian not intending on ever using a condom? But actually what you'd like to learn about is how to have safe sex when you're having oral sex with your partner. Lots of people I interviewed were never told how uh, two women in a bedroom, how they would engage in safe sex. That is a massive, that should be a big old health concern um, in terms of STIs, but that should, should also be a big happiness concern. Whenever we talk about STIs or it's not nice thinking about like sex and disease, right? Mm. But if you think about it, just simply being well, you know, that's, we're happy and healthy. Our human rights are respected. It's about, it's so much bigger than that. Um, if you only- So when you step into your twenties, some of the biggest things our listeners have shared with us are money orientated. We know it's hard to sometimes find your feet in regards to money when big life changes happen. Maybe you're leaving for uni, which means moving out, or you might just be moving out in general, whether it's a big career change, whether in your long-term relationship about to get married, whether you're starting a business. These big life moments can be expensive. That's why we've teamed up with our sponsors, Zopa Bank, to have more open and honest conversations around money. Yeah, to us, it's really important that we talk more openly with our friends and our close network about how money impacts our lives. We believe that the more conversations we have around money, the better our understanding of money will be. And the better our understanding of money, the better we're able to handle it. So let's stop brushing this under the carpet and start opening up. A big thank you to Zopa for supporting us on this mission. And if you want to find out more about Zopa Bank, just download their app. Um, if you only teach about rolling a condom down a banana, what happens when a young woman believes she has been stealthed by her partner? And you've, uh, stealthing being the practice in which a condom is removed during sex and uh, the woman doesn't know about it. Mm. How have you set her up to address what's happened and seek justice for what has just happened? An alarming amount of young people in the UK do not know what consent withdrawal is, for example, or how to withdraw themselves from a scenario that suddenly changes, one that they were consenting for under the conditions they'd agreed to verbally or non-verbally, as, as happens with sex. Yeah, sometimes you may be like, yeah, I really want it. And other times... Mm -hmm. you don't have to say something to each other. It, it just happens. And if you think about all these scenarios where lots of young people feel entirely unprepared for the real world of sex, tell me again that you want to really teach young people about rolling condoms down bananas. Mm -hmm. Of course, that should be part of it. Um, so much of our sex education was about avoiding teenage pregnancy uh, and also av uh, avoiding uh, spreading STIs or contracting STIs. What if we conceive of sex education not as risk mitigation or avoidance, but as what do we want? What do we want our adult sex life to look like? And suddenly it's not going to be about rolling condoms down bananas. Mm -hmm. I think one of the terms you've used already is like sex positive sex education for you then, what does a sex positive sex education curriculum look like? What would you want to see? It would take pleasure seriously. So after my book came out um, in 2022, there was new research in which a really wonderful, enormous analysis of health interventions were looked at. And they found that sexual health interventions, i.e. where people step in and try to, for example, lower the rate of STI transmission, when you discuss pleasure or when pleasure is part of that intervention, it is more likely to be successful. So we should be thinking about sex education, which part of it is hopefully uh, preventing the transmission of STIs and preventing teenage pregnancy. Why are we not talking about pleasure? If you look right now at the curriculum in England that was introduced not very long ago, because we have a new updated sex ed curriculum in England, look for the word pleasure anywhere in it and you will not find it. That for 2022 and onwards is not good enough. It wasn't good enough uh, for any era, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, given we just had an opportunity to update it, it's a real shame. It is completely absent. Sex positivity is not simply about pleasure. I think there's a lot of conversation, rightly so, about pleasure because lots of groups in society have not been able to access pleasure in sex for a very long time because of heteronormative and patriarchal norms. 
But if we really want to think about sex in a healthier way, we have to think about how do we all get equity in the bedroom? And depending on our own individual background, our own individual access to sex ed, our own individual families that we grew up in, how sex was discussed, have we, have we got serious taboos we need to get through? All of those being addressed is what sex positivity looks like. And ultimately, and this is what some people don't necessarily always agree with, sex positivity means we get to define and enjoy our sex lives the way that we want to and that we are not judged for it. Mm. And in every chapter of my book, I interviewed people who had been judged for the sexual choices that they had made. And they're quite predictable ones, probably, like young women being mm -hmm. deemed promiscuous um, by the people around them. But equally, men feeling deeply troubled that they had not had sex and felt, due to societal norms, uh, that they were outcasts, that, that mm. their mental health had plummeted as a result. Mm. Uh, people in the asexual community who've been made to believe that they're not normal. Uh, it has affected so many groups because they've either literally had someone judge them right in front of them or they've read something online or they've literally just absorbed what everyone is saying uh, and they have seen themselves judged and unable to feel happy about the sexual choices that they've made. Um, and if you think about sex positivity like that, mm -hmm. I would argue we live in quite a sex negative world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd have to agree. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you raised the topic of judgment there and that's a big, big factor in um, this sex talk. Um, and often the judgment is different for men and women. Um, in your book, you talk a lot about um, virginity and the conversation about that gendered, um, how how weighted that conversation is, and especially the judgment in terms of how, like you said there, men who might be virgins or women who might be virgins, it's viewed in very different ways. And I can only talk from the male perspective, but again, I know there's conversations where, um, yeah, men feel like outcasts because they are a virgin. Um, so if you're able to just explain like, how do those um, preconceptions, those judgments um, affect, affect the way we view our first experience of sex? No one should feel judged for anything really about uh, how they would like to lead their sex lives. There's no one way of sex really looking normal or uh, there may be sort of some things that are more common than others. But ultimately, it's what you want. As long as you're not causing yourself harm or someone else harm, it's all just about what you want. We all have different interests, different tastes, different, mm -hmm. different identities that need to be taken very seriously. When it comes to virginity, and I hate that word, and I do not think this word should exist anymore. Mm -hmm. It should have been one of the words uh, that we can only read about when we go to a, like an old-fashioned dictionary and we look it up. Mm -hmm. And instead, if you go online you'll find so many people, uh, people of all uh, sexual orientations and gender identities, distressed, they are still a virgin. Mm -hmm. In some cultures, it will be distress that they are no longer a virgin and fear persecution from the group around them. And in some cases, of, obviously there are people who would like to maintain uh, a state of sexlessness, not having had sex until they get married. And that's completely fine. What I would hope for people in that scenario is that when they do get married, they are fully sex educated. They know they feel confident and shameless about sex. And take, taking it back to virginity and the ongoing taboo and usage of the word, we, we haven't lost the desire to judge people around first time sex as a society. I have a Google alert set up for virginity that I started um, wow. when I wrote this book. And I, pe most people must hear that and think, you're a weirdo. Um, I wrote about Maybe sex, we'll just I promise. that section out. <laughs> <laughs> it's for research, I promise. But I did it to kind of look at, is there a media fascination about virginity? Mm. And I tell you every day I get an email. Every day, every, every day, day there is an email because around the world, people are writing articles about virginity, whether it's when a celebrity lost their virginity, no. whether it's about uh, ongoing conversations about 
normally young women mm-hmm. uh, maintaining their virginity till mm-hmm. marriage. And obviously this is all different in different parts of the world, mm-hmm. but it remains fetishized. Mm-hmm. I did a lot of research even into virginity auctions and all of it made it into the book. But uh, one uh, young woman who's, who sold her virginity uh, is interviewed in the book. I interviewed someone else who's currently trying to auction it. Um, and ultimately we're talking about a social construct with no biological reality, but there is still a lot of interest in when women, if whether women are virgins, uh, mm-hmm. I can remember being asked by men when I was a teenager, if I was a virgin or not. Uh, and they were clearly hoping for a yes. So what does that tell you about what it was that they wanted? What were the kind of power dynamics they were looking for in a bedroom scenario? Mm-hmm. As someone in my late twenties now, I can look back at that and see the horror in it. Uh, At the time, I I didn't quite see it because no one had set me up to understand things like gendered power dynamics in relationships. Anyway, there's a lot of research that we don't get told about when it comes to first-time sex. One of the examples that comes to mind is from Laura Carpenter, who's an American psychologist, and uh, she did some research. I believe it was maybe in the early 2000s or some point some point this century. Mm -hmm. And she found that people often conceive of their first time sexual experiences in in three different families of thought, really. They either thought it was a gift to be given, they thought it was a stigma to lose, or a sort of natural rite of passage people go through just that. Mm, All very different. All very different. Mm. If I asked you right now, Virginity is a gift to be given. Do you think more men or more women were part of that group? I'd say more women. I'd say more men. Men thought virginity was a their uh, gift to give. Oh no, not their gift to give, as in their gift to it take. would be their gift to take. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and you're right, more women yeah. saw themselves as part of that group. Virginity is a stigma to lose. Do you think that was gendered at all? I think probably more guys would be bothered about. I feel like this one might be more equally. So when she did the research, there were more men, but I would be fascinated to see if she did the research now, what it would be. Mm -hmm. I very much felt um, like I was being pulled apart when I was a young woman. I really felt Mm -hmm. both. I felt like there would be taboo and I would somehow at some point be punished for having sex. Uh, despite growing up in quite a sex positive liberal environment, simultaneously was desperate to have sex. And I thought, I can't go to university having not had sex. Mm. And I, if, if you're so busy thinking about ideas like that, whatever side you're on, whether it's one or the other or both, mm-hmm. and you're not thinking about this kind of rite of passage, you may or may not go through at some point in your life and sex is a journey. It's not oh, I do this thing this one time and everything changes about my identity (laughs) and everything, right? (laughs) Um, You're not thinking about what what healthy sex looks like. It's irrelevant of whether it's first time or every time. Sex has to be equitable. Everyone who is involved, whether it's two of you or more of you in the bedroom, everyone's identity, pleasure, interest, and autonomy and agency need to be respected. And that doesn't change whether it's the first time you have sex or the last time you have sex, whether you've had sex a million times or you've never had sex, Mm -hmm. that does not change. We also know from research that people who have a negative first sexual experience are more likely to suffer from sexual dysfunction as an adult. So this isn't only a matter of, oh, having a good time, having a bad time. No, we're talking about health here. We're talking about health. And if you have sexual dysfunction, we also know that that is tied to negative mental well-being. We know that is tied to conditions like anxiety and depression. Because hmm. understandably, any element of your health, if it was sort of tough for some time, you get down about it. And sex is no different. So that's why we need to get so much better at looking at first-time sex. Mm-hmm. Because first-time sex should have everything is appreciated and looked after in it as every-time sex and any-time sex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Carrying on that conversation then, I guess 
with that research being done in 2000s, you mentioned you'd love to see that research being done again. And I think it's really interesting because we do live in a social media driven world now where there are dating apps and sex is potentially more easily accessible or potentially one, you could argue that more people are having more casual sex as a result. Um, also, we've seen the rise of like sex positivity. So we've seen, you know, apps like OnlyFans kind of grow in popularity as well. There's definitely a conversation around how people feel about how many sexual partners they've had and how many people they've slept with before they go into relationships or is that and, and the conversations that they have. For you, when you were doing your research about this, what were the interesting things you found about people's conversations as they get a little bit more later into their sexual, sexually active lives? I interviewed a lot of people who were not in their late teens, early 20s anymore. They were in their late 20s, 30s. Mm. And the reason that they were talking to me was about an experience they had once had that they themselves could chart what happened next. You know, you look back at your life and you can see an experience that happened to you that should not have happened. And what happened next? And some, some of the anecdotes and the things that I drew from the interviews I had... You, you'd, to, I honestly think if I'd been told some of them, I could see myself having gone through the same thing. I could, I, 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 I would interview a lot of these people thinking, yeah, don't blame me for thinking that. I would have thought exactly the same thing. I remember one young woman told me, uh, in the book, I debunk a number of myths associated with virginity that go mm. on to police female sexuality long after first time sex. So mm. ideas around the hymen or mm. tightness around mm. the, the vaginal canal. Uh, one young woman said to me, she had had sex with her partner for the first time. And he said to her, he essentially accused her of having had sex before, that she had lied to him about her virginity status. Uh, and his justification for that was, you didn't bleed uh, and you don't feel tight. Can you imagine being told that sort of after your first sexual experience? Awful. And she was telling me this years and years afterwards. And it stuck with her. And it stuck with her. Mm. Uh, our words have power. And um, I know that with my content, I've reached her. With my content, have I reached that man? Uh, mm. If I don't reach him... My goodness, somebody has to because somebody has to make sure he never says that to a partner again because it's entirely based on zero science. Uh, he had no idea in saying what he said. He revealed himself to know absolutely <laughs> very little about the female anatomy, <laughs> yeah. right? But equally, if I had him here right now on that sofa, I wouldn't mock him. You know, I wouldn't say something like that. I would be very... I would try and find a common point and talk to him about it. But if I'm not reaching him, the education system's already lost him. Mm -hmm. This is someone who's already long out of the education system. Who was going to reach that man to tell him that that's wrong? And that's when it gets a bit scary. Uh, and that's when I get on my pedestal and say, we have to really be serious about the kind of content we make and commission and the people who hold power in society and the awareness campaigns and things. Um, we have to talk more about sex in a way we have not so far been comfortable talking about it. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned to Gabby earlier, one thing that I think is so great about your platform is that you are encouraging the conversations for both men and women. I should say that we're around women, of course, because it's a very important conversation, but the conversation surrounding men as well is just as important. So I really like the way you just said, if you don't, if you don't make content that will um, reach that man, who will? One of the most interesting chapters to write in my book was the one that focuses entirely on men, which is the virility mm. myth. And I went to an all girls school. I really learned far more about boys and men once I was at university in a mixed educational setting. And I cannot believe how my sex ed focused so much on the whole condom banana shenanigans. And uh, not only did it never actually tell me about when sex goes right, what should it look like? Mm -hmm. What does good sex look like or pleasurable sex look like? What does what does sex going wrong look like? What does dysfunction look like? What is it? And how it's eminently treatable 
and really normal. Um, the, the statistics in the UK, it's nearly half of men and over half of women will have had a sexual problem lasting three months or more in the past year. Sexual problems are really normal. Um, we've all had them and we're sort of not here talking about them because we've gotten to a stage of mental health where we're getting a lot better at, at saying, I've had anxiety, I've had depression, I've had this, I've had that. Yeah. But to say to someone, I'm having a really tough time, uh, I'm just in a complete erectile dysfunction, you know, moment at the minute. We're not, we're probably not going to say that. I've never heard anyone say that. So <laughs> no. it's, not, it's not a phrase we're, we're comfortable no. with. Is um, it? And it's so uncomfortable for uh, men to talk about that uh, many men would still rather never tell their partner about it who presumably knows about it, but yeah. they do not feel confident enough to communicate about it. It's very likely the partner has not been educated about it. I certainly didn't feel remotely educated about it as a young woman. All the education that I've done about conditions that men may have, I have done myself. Uh, and equally, all the educating I have done with partners, I really do believe I've been the first to talk them through what can happen to women. Um, and... Yeah, if if you might end up with a partner who has experienced it before or is sensitive or hopefully has the soft skills of sex, the soft skills of sex are kindness, altruism, respect. Uh, these are not the skills we're graded for at school. These are not yeah. the skills that we get GCSEs and A-levels in. Um, often we're told to be kind of confident and like aggressively ambitious and go for what you want and stuff. And not all of that is necessarily conducive to a good equitable sexual experience. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So I learned so much researching that chapter and I have been changed since researching it. I will never ever, I wasn't the kind of this kind of person anyway, but I would, would never ever make a joke or laugh at a joke again if it came to dick size, or if it came to, uh, oh, he can't keep it up, ha, ha, ha. That's something to laugh about. Mm give him a hug and say, go see a doctor. You know, they can sort it, right? And then he may be like, oh my goodness, no, I had no idea. And you've just really helped someone out. Mm -hmm. um, so that is something that's really absent, I think, from a lot of conversations around sex. Mm -hmm. It's really great that you highlight that because I feel like within that, there's that male, um, that topic of male desires. Like, of course, any man would like to think they wouldn't have that problem of erectile dysfunction or when they needed it most, it let them down or whatever. <laughs> but... <laughs> But um, I can see that a lot A lot of the way we view sex and we talk about the sex is kind of steered towards um, male desires and how sex is viewed from a male's perspective, as you were explaining. Why do you think that actually is? Um, I, I'm actually thinking back to a conversation myself, Gabby and George were having the other day in that um, f just flirting. So even before sex or anything, just flirting. Even in movies, we see it's more common for a man to flirt with a woman, but very, very unusual for a woman to flirt with a man or women to flirt with a woman or or any kind of situation. But that's a gender norm you've been socialized mm. to believe and you've grown up believing it because it's been reinforced by the world around you. And mm. even if it's, even, I, I think even if you have quite a liberal, open-minded family, it doesn't matter because the minute you leave the house, you're around the rest of the world. Yeah. And even if we look at the language that's used around sex, if we take penetrative versus non-penetrative sex, Amanda Monta wrote about this in her work and I address it in my chapter on the tightness myth, but uh, sex isn't penetrative for me because I'm not doing the penetrating. So what do I feel when that's happening? She mm -hmm. suggests enveloping. Uh, and I made a TikTok about it once and there were so many comments of people kind of thinking, I've never thought of it like that. What word mm, would I use? Yeah. <laughs> and the vocabulary around sex, even if you think about the history of writing and you think about the history of literacy, who has historically governed the media, who runs the media, mm. uh, words about sex would have at one point only have come from men in the written form, orally, obviously always from everybody. But... I think that is part of it. And if we don't come up with even new vocabularies for talking about sex, we don't think of these things. 
I made a TikTok once after I read this really cool piece of research that I mentioned in the book about how um, a bunch of researchers basically established that, hmm, when women have penetrative sex with men, uh, they often do things during those moments to stimulate the clitoris. Uh, And it's kind of different techniques that they'll do to kind of incorporate that stimulation into a relational sexual scenario. Uh, but there's, there aren't any words for it. There are no names for those things that they are doing. There are so many other names for uh, non-penetrative sex, for example, if you think about things that you may do during uh, full play experiences, which are hopefully full play, during play, uh, and after, after play experiences as well. Mm-hmm. You know, the language there is even quite rubbish. But <laughs> um, if you think about... We, when I say blowjob to you, you both know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, giving or receiving heads, you know what I'm talking about. There, there aren't even these slang colloquial terms for what a lot of women are using. So the researchers interviewed women and asked them what are the most common things that you do and they gave them names. Uh, and then I realised that these names, of this research has only really been spoken about in English language media. So I made a TikTok saying, hey, if you speak another language, I explained the research and I was like, can we come up with translations for these words so that we have them in other languages too. And now that that those TikTok comments are a repository for lots of different languages, how they would also name these techniques. If you can name something, you can learn it. You can sort of seek information about it to do it. You can tell someone about it. You can tell someone that you'd like it. Like it, it all helps communication Mm. that's a very long-winded answer to your uh often seeing sexual initiation from a male perspective but that is so heteronormative Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah you've got let's take for example two people who were assigned female at birth who initiate sex then ultimately either of them both of them at the same time (laughs) neither of them Uh, and that's ultimately what it what it should be in heterosexual scenarios as well it shouldn't be there is harm when the onus is only placed on one, as much as there is harm when the onus is never placed on the other. Mm-hmm. In those scenarios, women c- can find themselves becoming the gatekeepers of sex. Mm. Uh, like it's not up to them. Uh, someone else has to ask for it. And then if they give it, they may be punished for giving it. You know, we get into those thorny scenarios that are based on all these damaging heteronormative ideas we've been raised around. So just on that then, how do we better teach and understand um consent we need to stop conceiving of consent as something we can teach in a workshop and then never revisit in a lot of the interviews that I did with young people a lot of the problems that they had with their schools was not only down to the direct sex education they received in classes but the culture of the institution Uh, And this is something that I also uh, observed in interviews with people who were not talking about school environments, but were just speaking generally about things that that had happened to them. To build a culture of consent is to build a culture of sexual autonomy. So if you are in an educational setting and you're, you're a teenager, you're growing up, you're hopefully being prepared for your adult life by the people around you, not only your teachers, this is holistic. It is your parents. It is, it is your peers around you. It's the media who are should be feeling very, very responsible for the kind of stories that they are telling. Good sex education and good cultures of sexual autonomy will give us the information to go on and make informed choices about our sex lives. It's literally as basic as that. And our sex lives means our sexual health. Our sex lives means our mental health means our well-being, physical and mental, means everything. Having autonomy in sexual scenarios we find ourselves in is where consent comes to be. In a lot of really good books about consent that I've written, it's when something goes wrong, when your consent isn't respected. That's introduced in like halfway through the book because first you have to really build a culture of sexual autonomy and make young people have the self-esteem and the confidence and the knowledge base to then decide, okay, I am ready now to have sex. And your young person may make that decision at the threshold of the age of consent, you know, when they're 
16. Your young person may make that decision at 18. Your young person may make that decision as a not so young person anymore. <laughs> Who cares? Like it's mm -hmm. up to them. Sexual mm -hmm. autonomy is what we should be giving young people the right to access. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you deliver a workshop about consent and in it you're very victim blaming and you're just kind of like, oh, if you do this, you know, if you get drunk, you have sex. Well, <laughs> don't do that. Don't get drunk before you have sex because you can't consent. Um, or you're just given very scary statistics about criminal justice in the UK and how difficult it is to ever get a conviction for rape and mm -hmm. sexual assault, for example. If you just give scaremongering workshops like that, where you, go, you, must, you must say yes, you must get a yes before you have sex. Or if someone says no, you know, and, and, it, and it's just posited like a yes, no binary gives no room really for the gendered power dynamics that we encounter as adults. Uh, if we take, for example, consent withdrawal and two people who, who are perfectly consenting as they go into the bedroom, while they're in the bedroom, and something happens which is deemed to go against the conditions on which they agree to have sex. For example, if one of them suddenly behaves in a violent manner that was not predicted and not agreed upon and not spoken about, have you set up the, the victim in this scenario to have the sexual autonomy to know to leave that scenario, to know how to seek justice? Um, I always think about this piece of research that I found in the book that looked at heterosexual couples and anal sex mm -hmm. and a pressure that uh, a lot of young women face to have anal sex, the acceptance of pain known by the male partner that the reason their, their girlfriend was kind of saying, no, they didn't want it and they were pushing it. They knew uh, it could be painful for women, but still wanted to push it because they would kind of win points with their, with their male friends. They felt like mm. it was something they would accrue social status from. Anyone who'd been, who's been taught about sexual autonomy would not take part in any of that. Um, you can have whatever sex you like. And if, if, if you're a consenting couple that would like to have anal sex, that's, you know, it's wonderful. But, uh, if you're, if you're in a scenario where you feel like you are being coerced into a sex act by your partner, but you love them, you don't want to disappoint them, you have not been given, someone has not been there to give you the sexual autonomy you deserve in that scenario to say, this can't happen for the person who's trying to coerce. They've never been given the sexual autonomy lessons to understand they are being coercive. They possibly think they're just being normal. Everyone in relationships does this. Um, that's the absolute baseline we should be talking about. And, and often it is like, let's talk about consent and actually let's talk about sexual autonomy. If we teach sexual autonomy, we'll teach consent. Mm -hmm. Sophia, your book, Losing It, tell us more about it and where we can get it. Oh, hopefully you can find it pretty much anywhere one gets books. Uh, <laughs> so like in bookshops or um, you can find it online, Amazon, etc. Mm. You're holding up the hardback there. Oh, yeah. uh, when this goes out, my paperback will be available imminently, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, so you'll have a choice. Obviously, this one is nice and swanky. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's called Losing It, Sex Education for the 21st Century. Yes. The hardback is. The paperback. The paperback has a new name. The paperback's still called Losing It, okay. but it's Losing It, Dispelling the Sex Myths That Rule Our Lives. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Sophia. We always end our podcast with the same question that we ask every single guest. And it's a question for you, actually. Um, if you could look back at your 20-year-old self, so take yourself right back to the, your early 20s, and if you could give your 20-year-old self just one piece of advice, it could be do, could to do with sex or it could be just in general about your 20s, one piece of advice that would carry her through her 20s, what would you say to her? I want to answer a different question because... I would honestly tell 20 year old me to make every decision I have made mm -hmm. because the good decisions and the bad decisions that I've made, I've learned from all of them mm -hmm. and I have no regrets. Yeah. Uh, and that has come from generally probably being quite a bolshy person, but also having the privilege of two parents who love me and always be there for me. And I would not change anything about what, she did. Mm -hmm. other, other people may disagree with me, but I wouldn't change anything <laughs> that she did. 
What would I tell a 20 year old now? One of the most common questions I get DM'd is from people who don't know what they want to do. And often I get it because I'm a journalist, I'll often get people saying, oh, I think I want to be a journalist, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. You do not know whether you want to do something until you give it a go. You have to find a way to get an opportunity or join a club or do something where you get a taste for it. It's in doing that, I've often learned what I really don't want to do. Absolutely. And that has helped me kind of funnel and work out, oh, I'm good at this. Uh, people, other people think I'm good at this or I love doing this. Mm -hmm. um, you should not find yourself, this is whether you're in a job or with a partner, you know, any choice that you, you are making about your life, you should never find yourself in a scenario where you're thinking, hmm, don't really know if I want to do this. Mm -hmm. You need to live and breathe it. And there'll be something out there for you. It's out there. If you haven't yet met it, that's probably why you're thinking, I don't know what I want to do. Um, so go out, go out and meet those opportunities and then you'll know, you'll know mm -hmm. what to do. Mm -hmm. We've never had that before, but that's amazing advice. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. Thank you, Sophia. It's been so, so lovely to have you in the studio. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Learned so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> A big thank you to you, yes you, for tuning into this episode of the Talk 20s podcast. We hope it inspired you in some way and popped a little pep in your step for this week. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review and share this episode with a friend. It means a lot to us to have your support. We also love hearing your stories and suggestions. You can reach out to us on all socials by searching at Talk 20s. Lastly, before we go, our website talk20s.com is the hub for all things 20-somethings. Go check out my people. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.